evening and welcome to Woodstock Regional Artists. I'm your host, Sal Michio, coming to you from my home studio in West Hurley, New York, along with our producer engineer, David Lex, who is in the control room at Studio A in Sorgonese, New York. Tonight's guest is a keyboardist, arranger, composer, and band leader, Pete Levin. Good evening, Pete. Welcome to the show. Thank you, Sal. Good to be here. Now, you've, uh, you've played with a number of people, uh, a list so long that I can't read them all, but I'd like to mention a few of them, uh, including uh, Blood, Sweat, and Tears, the Boston Symphony Orchestra, the Brubeck Brother Quartet, Butterfield Blues Band, uh, Judy Collins, Miles Davis, the Five Satins, Government Mule, Gregory <laughs> Hines, Annie Lennox, Chuck Mangione, Lee, Lisa Minnelli, and the New York Philharmonic Orchestra, amongst many, many others. Uh, Doing alphabetically, I can, I can hear. <laughs> yes, they are alphabetic, too. <laughs> uh, tell us about the, some of your experiences of playing with these folks. It's eclectic, as you can see, very eclectic. Uh, I've been involved in so many things, uh, so many great experiences. Uh, I, I would, I've been very lucky, actually. The phone it keeps ringing. I've made myself accessible to many situations over the years. Uh, I was uh, anchored in New York City uh, really for 25 years or, or so, mostly as a studio musician, as a, as a programmer, computer programmer, arranger, composer, all, all of that, and band leader. Especially in the 70s when I, when I was breaking in, uh, there were so many opportunities uh, to do stuff in it like that. So, wow, that, that's not what I do, but yeah, I'll do that, sure. Uh, uh, and it, uh, Ultimately, it generates that ridiculously long list that you were reading from. Uh, some of those people I played with extensively, recorded with extensively. Some of them I may have done one gig or one tour. Terrific. Uh, you received critical accolades for some work you've done during uh, the 15 year association with uh, legendary Gil Evans and your eight year stint with jazz uh, artist Jimmy Jufri. Mm -hmm. uh, what what did you do those years? What, what were you? Those two, uh, uh, those two men, uh, Gil Evans, who's a legend, uh, and Jimmy Jufri. I think once I was out of school, those those two men are my mentors. Both of them gave me opportunities to uh, do their music, but do my thing to experiment and to expand my myself, my own experiences. Uh, Jimmy was a, a woodwind player and a composer. We, we toured all all over the world. Gil's end. Uh, would say uh, it ranged anything from you know from twelve to twenty players, to, depending on what we were doing, and there were always amazing musicians in the band. Mm -hmm. And uh, Gil hired musicians to play in his band because he liked the way they played. He liked what they did, uh, not necessarily to fill a slot, an important slot in his orchestration. He hired me as a French horn player. And I started bringing a, uh, a Moog synthesizer to gigs uh, because there were so many soloists in the band. We'd play the head and there'd be five or six soloists. So I'd sit there twiddling my thumbs for 10 minutes, 15 minutes. So I brought I brought the Moog, I showed it to Gil. I said, can I just try some stuff while, while, it, while it's going on? He said, sure, do it. And, and he liked it a lot. I said, no, do more of that. Uh, and I got to a point where I couldn't, get back to the horn in time to play a, a background chorus or an out chorus. So he said, you know, stay with the keyboards. And he hired another horn player uh, to cover what I couldn't get to. And, you know, how many band leaders would, would you do let somebody do that? It's it absolutely amazing. But this is by 75, 76, I was a synthesizer specialist in New York. And that's pretty much what I was doing every day, you know, playing on recording sessions, uh, sometimes live gigs, touring. Uh, uh, I was in Europe a lot. There were a lot of jazz bands going to Europe during the 70s. And Gil would go twice a year, we'd go to Europe and the Far East. And I carried a mini Moog with me. Uh, it didn't ship, but I carried it. You just give it to him. It was crazy. And so Gil was a mentor. I mean, it, there's something of Gil in everything that I do, everything I play. And the current bands that you're associated with now are your uh, Pete Levin Trio, uh, the Mobius Band, and the Levin Brothers, you and Tony. Um, and uh, are you uh, 
do it. Is there anything happening now? Or I know everything has been going sour with the pandemic. But, uh, with the <laughs> That's a nice way to say it. But, <laughs> uh, yeah, these were all uh, in the past, but every, everything is on hold now. Uh, the uh, trio I recorded with Dave Stryker and Lenny White, uh, we toured over in Europe twice and, and played in this country a while. That's going back a couple of years. Uh, uh, I tried to I tried to do some of that last year, but Dave Stryker, uh, it's it's like everybody discovered him all at once. He got really big, so he was he was too busy. Uh, I still do organ trios. I'm currently doing one with uh, uh, a couple of great local players, and I know you know uh, Jeff Siegel on drums and Mike D'Amico, a, a guitar player I've been working with for many years. But I haven't been able to do any kind of touring with with, with a trio, which I wanted to do. I expected to take a tour, a trio to Europe this summer, this past right. summer. That right. didn't happen. Uh, the Levin Brothers has been active for about six years now. Uh, we had uh, Jeff Siegel is also in in, in that band. Uh, we had uh, I'm say European tour, South American tour, and a Far East tour. We were supposed to do this year, all all canceled. Uh, you know, for me, it's jazz money being lost. But Tony, we have to schedule the Levin Brothers in between King Crimson tours, uh, which of you course know, all of that got canceled. So Tony was losing some serious money there, rock and roll money, as I, I call it. I uh, have a lot of offers to go places, but we, right. uh, just not private. I wouldn't dare get on an airplane now. My Mobius band, this was the band I always wanted to put together. We recorded uh, two days live in the studio, uh, which we did up here at, at Scott Petito's in our studio. And it, we came in, here's the music, here's the charts. We read, we try it, we record it. Good take, move on. Do another take, fine. That was it. It was a live band. Uh, just just playing. It was Lenny White, uh, our iconic drummer. Tony, my brother, playing bass. Uh, a friend of mine, uh, Jeff Chomper, wonderful guitar player. Uh, Nani Assis, uh, a tremendous Brazilian percussionist. And uh, two of my favorite horn players, Alex Foster. Uh, it's a great saxophone player. He's been doing Saturday Night Live, or was doing Saturday Night Live. And Chris Payson, the trumpet player, lives up here, which is great. Right, uh, Chris. Uh, and uh, the whole plan was to travel with that band this year, and like, everything just just ground to a halt. Right. Well, I think it's time for us to go to a, a video of, of yours. This is a promotional video of the Levin Brothers. And uh, I, I like this so much, I like to play it uh, for, for the folks to see. Uh, folks, uh, take a look at this because there's some... Uh, some pictures of some old stuff going on that you will remember from your past. And this is called a not so square dance. <laughs> Eleven brothers. <laughs>
Pete, that was a great uh, promotional video. Uh, uh, where did you do that? We, uh, that was done at Scott Petito's studio. Well, you had mentioned uh, being a synthesizer player at one of the uh, originals uh, back in the 70s that you became sought after by uh, as a side man and a studio musician for and many live gigs. And as a writer and music uh, musician, uh, you worked with uh, film scores, jazz and pop records, and hundreds of TV and radio commercials. Can you uh, tell us about uh, some of those TV and radio commercials that you worked oh, with? Lord. Just the general picture uh, of music in the 70s. It was kind of grim. It, uh, I mean, half of it was disco. Uh, uh, which had you know, taken over the pop world, uh, um, uh, the films, uh, commercials, almost um, everything was disco. Uh, some music, the overall music picture was kind of lame, but there was a lot of work. It was a great decade for musicians. Everybody was working. Uh, I was doing one or two recording sessions every day, uh, and a lot of them being uh, commercials. Uh, the TV radio commercials. The routine was the rhythm section would come in at nine o'clock. Uh, we would have a thirty-second version and a sixty-second version. They wanted us. They wanted it played and the band on the way out the door by nine thirty, so they could set up for the horns or strings or singers or whoever's coming in next. Uh, I might do that and then have another another jingle at eleven or twelve. Uh, uh, if it was in the afternoon. Uh, uh, there were a couple of big Chinese restaurants right in midtown, the town square area, and, and dozens of musicians would meet in there and have a, you know, a big big bowl of noodle soup waiting for your next session. It was like that. And then play a jazz gig at night. Sometimes I'd be on a record project. It, would, it, it could be three hours at least. It could go all day. If I was on the project as a programmer or the keyboard player for the whole project, I might be in a studio for 12 hours a day for a couple of weeks. Uh, the period was like that. The singers made a lot of money. Uh, the most successful people I knew at the time in the music business were the singers, the singers. would come in after us. Uh, they got paid every time it got aired anywhere in the country. Uh, musicians scale, I think, was $52 and change. Period. That's it. And, that you know, it. <laughs> so you had to do a lot of them. I think we'll play another video of yours. Uh, this one here is uh, the Levin Brothers uh, live. Uh, at uh, the Baked Potato in L.A. Ah, huh. This is called Ostropolia. Let's play the tune and we'll talk about it on the other side.
Astropolia, is that the place in Russia that your mother was it is, born? It is, it is Russian. Uh, our mother was born in Austro Austropolia, which I believe is Astropolia, uh -huh. it's something like that. Uh, my mother's family escaped from Russia when she was seven, but, but she had very distinct memories of this town, a little tiny town with dirt roads. She remembered stories and would tell us stories about the uh, like Saturday night, Russian soldiers would get drunk and come roaring through town and killing people just for fun, for sport. But they escaped. They were lucky. They got out. Yeah, yeah. Tony was uh, fascinated by Australia and where it was. He found it on an older map, and he had uh, uh, he did some work in Russia for somebody several years ago uh, for a local promoter. He went over and played with a Russian artist, and he took some time to himself. He hired a driver, and they went looking for Australia. <laughs> wow. And predictably, it was gone. But in the spirit of that, Tony wrote that little that little tune called Ostropolia. So over the years, uh, it dispersed with Gil Evans, Paul Simon, Annie Lennox, and uh, Jimmy Jufri. Uh, you have done arranging and electronic music for feature films, including Missing in Action, Lean on Me, Silver Bullet, The Color of Money, and Star Trek, all movies that I've seen a couple of times, actually. Okay. And then you composed a, a orchestral score for the independent film uh, Zolimo. Yep, so, that's a Zolimo. Russian film. He wrote the original score for a uh, stage production of uh, the book. Yep. Create, uh, he created uh, an electronic music score for Linda Rogers' award-winning surgical audio tape series. What was that all about? This is Richard Rogers' daughter. Uh, she was into what can I do to make people's lives better. She became aware of how chaotic things were in, a, in an operating theater, very noisy, people talking. And she asked some doctors about that and, and uh, got good opinions that uh, when somebody's uh, under anesthesia and asleep, uh, they can't react, but they are aware of what's going on around them. That kind of chaos or noise would, would alter their vital signs, uh, blood pressure, heart wow. rate, you know, things like that. So she came up with a scheme to uh, play music for the for the patient uh, while they were under anesthesia, uh, and she had me create music, uh, like long thirty minute pieces of music. Uh, the objective being to just mellow people out so much that they would just be in their own world with their headphones. Oh, I remember we picked a set of headphones with big cushion cups that would screen out outside noise. And as she told me, it can't be anything catchy. So I should write 30 minutes worth of music with no melody, no rhythm, and no harmony. Uh, she wanted me to just keep it really, really mellow. She, uh, she had the foundation uh, distribute these tapes uh, to hospitals. Uh, along with the with the Sony Walkman, uh, and they worked. You know, we, we got good feedback from that. That's terrific. And, and doctors saying, "Yeah, wow, you know, the, the, the patient's blood pressure was just hung right there. The heartbeat didn't move. It was great." So, so you did the official band chorus arrangement of the U.S. Infantry song, and composed the anthem for the 1992 United Nations Earth Summit performing it live at the United General Assembly. Wow, that's kind of interesting. A plan a General Assembly to everybody? To everybody and <laughs> representatives of the world? Sure, I'll do that. That's uh, great. There's uh, that particular time I did it with a singer and a saxophone player friend. Just I brought a keyboard and the three of us just performed it. It was a the actual recording of that anthem had a big chorus and a, and a full band. So, but you, one of your favorite collaborations was with uh, your brother, bassist Tony Eleven, and uh, drummer Steve Gadd uh, for The Clams, a Spike Jones tribute band that produced a top 40 single, Close to You, uh, now a cult classic. Wow, uh, Spike Jones, huh? Spike was a genius in his own way. Uh, Tony and I were big Spike Jones fans. Tony's idea originally was, you know, let's, let's try something. He's got this idea. Uh, let's do a Spike. We didn't call it tribute bands at the time. That, that term didn't come into use till later. But yeah, let's let's do take a tune. We'll trash it and do it like Spike Jones. Uh, we spent the weekend in the recording studio in New York. Uh, uh, Steve Gadd, I'm sure you'd know of, a legendary drummer, uh, was a uh, 
a schoolmate of Tony's uh, at Eastman Rochester. Uh, so we got Steve to come in and play, and uh, some friends of mine, at, uh, and we did this crazy recording. I, and I sang lead. Uh, the only time I've ever sang lead, it was a, a bona fide top 40 hit. Why the birds suddenly appear every time I come here? Just like you, they long to be a note to me. First time I heard I was driving, I had to pull over to the side and just wait and let it finish. It was like, <laughs> Uh, it, it was pretty amazing. Completely goofy. There's a link to it on my website. Let's go to another video of yours. Uh, this is a, a longer tune, which uh, I enjoyed. A uh, very sweet tune. It's called uh, When I Was Young. Thank <laughs> you. 
Thank you so much. Hey, that was very really sweet. Who were who were the uh, members of that band at the time? Those are the, uh, the two guys were uh, John Caridi, who's a wonderful studio guitarist. The drummer uh, is, of course, a, a local friend of ours, Harvey Sorgan, a wonderful drummer. And that particular video was uh, it's in Italy. We, we were on a European tour, like three or four weeks. Uh, in 89, you uh, released your first solo jazz album, uh, Party in the Basement, uh, for Gramavision. Uh, this was followed by uh, Solitary Man, uh, two unique jazz uh, Christmas CDs, and as a duo with drummer Danny Gottlieb, and through the 90s, a series of electronic music albums for Alternate Mode Records. Uh, in 2006, you uh, revisit your first love, the Hammond organ, and release five albums in expanded organ trio format, culminating with Jump in 2011. And I want to play that music right now. This is the title song from the CD Jump. It's called Jump.
was a great solo. That was a killer trio. It was a killer, killer trio. trio. Yes, killer trio. It, Dave Stryker had been around and working for a while. He was just starting to get discovered. By people who were just starting to realize how good he, he is. Uh, uh, because I don't know if we'll get to talk about it, but some of these organ trio albums uh, that you refer to, but uh, I have right? a love affair with different guitar players, and I, I just worked with a whole bunch of uh, different guitar players over the years. Uh, each one with his own style, uh, and his own thing to bring to the music. Lenny's career, when he was 19, 19 years old. He did his first record date with Miles Davis. Oh, okay. uh, I mean, an album that is a, a classic album now. Uh -huh. And, and his, his career has gone nothing but up from there. Of course, his many years with Chick Corea uh, as a producer is a tremendous player and, and a good friend of mine. He's a great guy, too. It's, okay. one, it's nice when those two things come together. You, you get somebody who's a real gentleman, a good person, and generous, and a tremendous musician at the same time. Okay, and uh, of course, uh, the, your, uh, the 11 brothers is uh, you and Tony, mm -hmm. and of course, uh, Mobius uh, is a, a great 70s man that you've mentioned who, who the members were before. Uh, you have some CDs out here i like to mention uh, in chronological order. They are Deacon Blue, 2007, uh, Certified Organic in 2008, Jump, 2010, uh, live at the Iridium in uh, 2013, and uh, Mobius 2017. So, uh, where can folks uh, see, uh, hear your music, download your music from? I think everything is streaming off of CD Baby. All my CDs were on CD Baby. CD Baby is no longer selling CDs. They're all they only are uh, organized downloads and streaming. Uh, so. Uh, I have to set up a, a, a new platform. I'm doing some off my website, but I don't do that too much. But one of the realities of the music business, uh, music business is, is not doing very well at the moment, as, as we all know. Uh, really the only effective way of selling CDs right now, if if you're just uh, kind of in the middle, and one of the truth, not a big, not a big artist, obviously, which uh, the most effective way of selling it is at live gigs. Uh, Bring them to the gigs. Uh, yeah. you, you do a set, you hold up a CD, you say, hey, we'll come and sign them for you. Right. Uh, this is uh, this is the year of the COVID. Uh, there are no live gigs. Uh, so, your website is called uh, PeteLevin.com, mm -hmm. and you're on Facebook as Pete Levin. Well, Pete, it's been a great uh, session this evening, and uh, we've heard some great uh, stories from you and heard some good music. And uh, all these luminaries, uh, you are one of them, my friend. Well, that's our show for this evening, folks. Uh, we've been listening to Pete Levin. So tune in next Tuesday when we'll have another special guest for you. And until then, be safe out there and support your local artists in any way you can. Please do that. Thank you, and good night.